Hello, welcome to lecture number five, Systems Medicine. It's very nice to see you all. Let's all take a nice deep uh, sigh of relief. <sighs> right away, another one. <sighs> and, you know, we can con congratulate ourselves for successfully fully finishing part one of the course in which we described the principles of how a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Tissue growth, cells come from cells leads to a problem of exponential uh, organ size. Nice big sigh of relief. <laughs> and the, therefore, tissues have feedback loops to keep size control in homeostasis, which causes the fragility to mutants. It misses the signal, causing fragilities to dynamic diseases and uh, autoimmune diseases. We talked about the HPA axis last time and about an oscillator of two cell glands, how it creates a timer that can entrain to the seasons and maybe related to mood disorders like bipolar disorder, the time scale, to the time scale of bipolar disorder. And if you haven't seen any of these lectures, uh, the videos are all uh, online. So hi to everyone watching. Uh, and today we're going to switch gears. We get to part two of the course, which is called aging. This part is about aging. We're going to explore the human life cycle and why is it that we age? Why is it that we age? What happens during aging? And uh, what are the consequences of aging, the theories about aging? and also aging-related diseases. Why do some diseases uh, increase with age? What, is there a universal mechanism underlying age, the, time, the timer for aging between different people? Absolutely fascinating. Ready? So let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and so when we talk about aging, I want to begin with a, a, an example which doesn't have aging. So imagine there's some organisms, uh, hypothetical organisms, that don't age. They stay the same. They're born, they say, let's also say they don't reproduce. Okay? They don't age and they don't reproduce. And they're living on an island somewhere, and we have these hypothetical organisms. Let's say we start with n of zero, this is the number of organisms, 10 equals zero, they don't age, they don't reproduce. What do they do? I don't know. And now, on this island, there's some predators, and these predators uh, hunt them and kill them at some rate. So that's called extrinsic mortality. <coughs> extrinsic because it comes from the outside, it's predator. They're the same. No matter if they're 100 years old, 2,000 years old, they're the same. N rate, age zero. So if I draw here, this is going to be, I'm introducing some concepts for our lecture. The hazard, which is hazard age, which is risk of death per unit time. So this is time, and this is the hazard. It's constant. Okay. And what will happen to their population? So we, huh? They decrease, of course, because they're being hunted down. They don't reproduce. So, uh, so this is how many organisms are left at time t, and this is the risk of death per unit time. And the solution is. this, because if we differentiate this, we get the H0 up front. So we're going to plot another important function, the survival. Survival is how many are left. Survival at time t is how many there are at time t divided by how many we started with. So we started 1 at t equals 0, and this looks like this. It's an exponential decay. And it's like radioactive particles, right, that uh, de decay uh, because the hazard is constant. That's what it looks like if you don't have aging. Okay. What does it look like if you do have aging? So in order to, uh, to do that, I want to draw the survival curve for human beings and the hazard curve for human beings. Right. So 
let's imagine you took the data from Sweden in 2012 and you plot here age. We're going to call age tau here. This is going to be our symbol for age. And here is the survival. So you take a, a cohort of Swedes born in uh, 1880, let's say. And you ask how many are left. It could be Americans, it could be. And instead of an exponential decaying curve, you get something that looks like this. So with the mean time here, so this halfway point here, this is the mean lifespan. Let's say 80, OK? The What's the difference between two gra these two graphs? Is it for our hypothetical organisms, it doesn't matter what age they are. Right from the start, they start their number decrease. For human beings, it's, it's rare to die when you're young. So when you're 10, 20, it's rare. It's unfortunate. It's tra tragedy, 30, 40, 50, maybe some deaths, 60. 70, it's not so unusual to die. So at some point, it's not so unusual. 80, 90, it's really not unusual. 100, very not unusual, right? So maybe you don't, not a lot of people make it to 100. So there's a difference between being young and being old. Something accumulates in us. Something is different in us. And hello, ah, so nice that you're here. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> We're still alive. And, and in order to uh, get even a higher resolution, it's very instructive to plot the graph that we're going to be uh, interested in, particularly in this lecture and the next lecture, which is, is the hazard. The hazard, the risk of death per unit of time, in, 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 let's say, the risk of dying in a given year. And here we plot age, the age of human beings. So this graph looks like this. It starts, so I'm going to, here's um, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3. Oh, I'm, by the way, I'm, this is log. I'm going to put the log hazard because it varies over a large range. Okay, 10 to the minus 3. Here we have 10 to the minus 2. Here, 10 to the minus 1. Here's 1. So 10 to the minus 1, 10% chance to die in a given year. So you start at about 3, 10 to the minus 3. And what happens in the f when you're born? And what happens in the first year? It goes down. So interestingly, there's a lot of mortality around birth. This has to do with birth defects, pregnancy complications, and nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and even though what we're talking about is not such a relief, this is infant mortality. Right? And it could be congenital disease. If you're unlucky, you're born with a terrible mutation in all the cells in, your, in the egg, all the cells in your body. So there are thousands of these very rare diseases. They're very unfortunate. You die, and then until age 10 here, there's a nice minimum of 10 to the minus 4. Question. Is this still extrinsic hazard? Ah, thanks. What I'm drawing here is all-cause mortality all-cause mortality, so, but as we'll soon, s and then I'll separate out for you. I'll separate out. And, and then at around age 15, it starts rising. Yeah. Looks like this. And rising. <coughs> Rising, rising, rising. But not only rising, it looks like a really nice, nice linear graph here. Rising, rising. So what does this mean? It means your risk of death grows exponentially. In fact, it more or less doubles every eight years. So the risk of death. Goes like e to the alpha t. Rises. It doubles about every eight years. 50, 60, 70, 80. 
And then around 80, it saturates. So it not saturates, it slows. The risk, risk of length slows. And above 100, it's not clear because there's not a lot of data. <coughs> but there's some indications that it kind of plateaus to 50% per year. Therefore, you know what, what you can say on to a person who's 120 on their birthday. Have a nice day. <laughs> okay. So we're interested, we're going to be interested in, we're all even try, going to try to explain this linear law here and also the slowdown. This, okay. I'm presenting you with the facts of life, the facts of death, actually. So, the human life cycle has some transitions that are interesting. One is this birth, weaning, we stop uh, suckling, these years of childhood. And then here we have this puberty, that's where this rise occurs, is, a, is growth, body grows. So, you're born, you grow fast, growth rate goes down, and then puberty is another peak. Then you stop growing, it's basically sexual reproduction period. Yeah. And if, now, there was a question about extrinsic versus intrinsic mortality. So, in fact, if I plot just intrinsic mortality, I say I, so what is extrinsic mortality for human beings? It's a lot of extrinsic is accidents, suicide, homicide, right? and that extrinsic mortality is, looks something like this. Grows, it grows slightly with age, but you can say it's more or less constant across the lifespan. The reasons are a little different, more suicide at old age, more accidents at young age, more, more homicide at young age. More. But if you subtract that extrinsic mortality, this runs this exponential down to here. So it's, and th they're about equal at around age 30, 40, the extrinsic and intrinsic mortality. Depends, for women, 40, for men, 35. Men have more extrinsic mortality. Okay, I'm going to pause for a question. Yeah. This graph suggests that the 10 year old has less chance of dying than a 30 or a 20 year old, where usually 10 year olds are they're sick more and it seems like they're less. Uh, so the comment is for this graph, it seems like exactly what you said. The risk of dying in your, between your year 10 and 11 is smaller than your risk of dying between your year 20 to 21. And that's correct. Yeah, but. 10-year-olds are sick more than 20-year-olds. Okay, the comment is they're sick more than 20-year-olds. Yes. That may be true, but they don't die more. I can <laughs> promise you because this is very solid. I should say um, this graph um, looks like this for basically all countries, but the differences are primarily in the extrinsic mortality. So if you go to, okay, I want to tell it in, a, in this way. This law, as it goes like e to the alpha t at a certain period, actually it's not that bad. It can go between 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 1, three decades of hazard, three orders of hazard. Right? This law is called, uh, it's, it's, it's a famous law, it's called Gompert's law. And uh, Gompert's was a mathematician living in England, and he couldn't get work uh, associated to the fact that he was Jewish. And he found work by calculating life history tables for insurance companies. And he was a really good mathematician. And he noticed that this, this, uh, this law in 1825. So it was OK in 1825 England, where people lived average lifespan. I would be surprised if it was more than 50. A lot, of ch a lot of childhood mortality, for example. So that, that differs a lot. And if you look at different countries and different regions, you have, oh, he found so nice he joined us. Oh, and David, too. Nice deep side, really. <laughs> so glad to see you. These two gentlemen are doing a postdoc with me. And they're learning a lot from them. And, you know, a uh, so extrinsic mortality difference, but the slope doesn't differ very much. Uh, sometimes you get curved. So that's the Gompert's law. Um, 
by the way, in America, is the only Western country where mean lifespan has been going down for the last three years. So that's lifespan, mean lifespan is, is extended over the last hundred years, and every day that you li live, you get an extra six hours, I think, of lifespan, if, if you follow the trajectory of the last few hundred years. And the main reason is hygiene, and less infant mortality, hygiene, clean, and uh, also <coughs> recently some, some medical intervention, antibiotics, stents, things like that. But unknown how, how much further it can rise, right? It's not clear, we talked about that. If, so uh, okay. an oldest person living is you know, around 120, and is this the maximum possible lifespan? Is it more, we want, we want to think about that. Um, all right, um, so let's just see where we are. So we talked about what a hazard is, risk, extrinsic mortality, survival, gompers, and the slowdown. And now, I want to say that the Gompert's law is not only for human beings. If you look at uh, animals and you measure their risk of death, so animals have different lifespans, right? A mouse lives, let's say, two and a half years. And a little C. elegans worm, uh, these are the favorite pets of biologists because you can grow them. Why do you like to grow them? Because their life, their life cycle is so slow, so fast that you can get it in two weeks. They born, die. So you, E. coli, you're right, it gives rise in, in, a, in an hour or so to progeny. So uh, lifespan varies between organisms. E. coli is just one cell. Cell against is a worm with 1,000 cells, 1,024, 304 neurons, big brain compared to them. Flies live for 30 days, fruit flies, Drosophila, all the favorite organisms. And, and these different organisms also show um, the Gompert's law, so sometimes there's not enough decades so you can argue is it really exponential or not, but uh, for flies it's very nice and for, um, so, but it definitely rises the hazard like this. And it's, it's not a bad approximation to say that across animals, almost all animals where it's measured, the Gompert's law is a good approximation for the hazard increases with age. But of course, time is compressed for if you're shorter than for longer. So it's nearly universal. There's some argument for some, for some uh, organisms, hydra and naked mole rats, and it's not clear, but let's call it nearly universal. So for some trees, maybe it's different. You can have, even for trees, you can have hazard go down with age. There's some exceptions, but we're going to think about it as nearly universal. And, OK. And when you look at these model organisms, you can have a great advantage to ask. So this graph shows that uh, survival is, is high when you're young. It's, it's lower. You, know, you start dying when you're old. But you see there's still a variation between people. Right? There's still a variation. So not everyone dies at age 81.2. If that happened, you can imagine what the world would look like. Now stop imagining. And call <laughs> <me>. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there's some variation. What's the variation? Coefficient of variation. Thirty percent? What do you think? Uh, point three. Yeah. So about, let's say variation is let's say thirty percent. Let's imagine something like that. And now you can ask. Maybe that's because we're born different, right? We have different genes. We of course we have different genes. So, and uh, animals help us uh, test that. You can come in. Don't worry. Really? Come on, come on. I insist. I, I, I wish I could come in. If you had the time? Yeah. yeah. You must be a professor. No. Not yet. Oh, a researcher. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. You missed the secret of eternal youth. I'm going to tell you in this lecture. You know, sometimes you get an invitation. <laughs> to listen. Too busy, but you're too busy. Yeah. All right. All right, so, so you can take, let's say, a cohort of genetically identical mice. They're born from the same mom. They're grown in the same cage in another cohort like this. And ask, <coughs> do, okay, now they're going to die at exactly 2.5 years, right? Because they're genetically identical, grown in the same conditions. And the answer is no. Those genetically identical mice have this, the same 30% variation, you can say. Of course, it's not 80. For them, it's two and a half years. But... 
Same thing with uh, C. elegans worms, which you can measure, ex ex really, you can ma make these aging <coughs> machines where you grow the worms and you watch them squiggle around and, and, and measure them, their activity, and see how they age. And so, and so you can measure thousands and thousands, and so also the genetically isogenic worms and flies that are as, as, as genetically similar as cats. So it's not, the variation is not due to inherently to genetic differences. And also in people, when you look at family trees, you say how heritable the, the longevity is between brother, sister, cousin, great grandfather, etc. The estimate is less than 20% of the variation in, less than 20% of the variation in longevity is genetic. People die of different things. That's genetic. Could be cancer, genetic, so lifespan. So it's not very heritable. And it does, of course, depend on conditions. So we know that in human beings, uh, longevity and illness and rises the lower your socioeconomic status. That's a very, very strong correlation. So it does depend on conditions, of course. But uh, there's some stochastic, or which means random, thing about di dying that's not purely genetic or environmental, as evidenced by these lab organisms. Is it, you're asking is it possible to test on humans yeah. what? If, if uh, death is not heritable. So the question is how do you measure the heredity of longevity? So you take a big family tree. So one study I'm aware of did 80 million people, full family trees, and ask if the longevity of dad was this and mom was this. What's the longevity? And from that you can calculate the heritability. It's a statistical correlation basically. And it came to less than 20%. Explained less, genetics explained less than 20% of the var variation in lifespan. So most traits like, uh, traits like height is maybe 80%. Traits like uh, all kinds of personality traits is usually 50%. Huh? Yeah, height is very heritable. And personality traits and things like 50%. And if something is 20% or even probably 15%, it's considered low heritability, low heritability. Of course, there could be an exception. Could be some longevity gene in the fractional population. Then you get five, five siblings. They're all 100 years old. It's, it could be, but on average, it's not a huge factor. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I know. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Some problem in relating this to graphs. Yeah. You say that the hazard increases quickly after age of 10. Yeah. Is so flat. flat. So thank you. So yeah, if okay. I take a microscope here, I see flat. I could see this slow decay here, and even the, a, a little decay here in the beginning, first year. But just if you look at the numbers, yeah. uh, ten to the minus four. So, so that's why it's nice to look at hazard. Hazard is more like a microscope that sh shows you the slope <coughs> here. Just because the absolute number, the absolute number is so tiny. Did I answer your question? Yeah. And it's, yeah, okay. yeah. 20% variation explained by genetics is for total mortality or like longevity in total or when you talk about intrinsic, intrinsic uh, mortality? Because that's a big uh, noise factor that may good change from like height. Good point. So the question is, is it extrinsic mortality or intrinsic mortality that's accounting? And I don't know the answer, but I can just say that the majority in this uh, Western countries is intrinsic mortality. I mean, extrinsic is, is a small factor. Of course, it is heritable. Why is it heritable? Because if your dad and mom lived in an inner city ghetto, you were likely to do that too. And then the homicide rates are much higher. And you have, so yeah, extrinsic mortality is heritable, right? You have a skin color that makes you more likely, less likely to. You have whatever. So that's, uh, that's a non, it's not. It's not genetic, it's a combination between genes and stigma and environment and social economic status. So those things are difficult to entangle. So that's why we talk a lot, in, unlike previous lectures, a lot about model organisms and mice and stuff, because then you can, you can disentangle things like that. Nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> All right, so we have uh, isogenic. Another interesting thing you can do with animals is ask, can you uh, extend lifespan and shrink lifespan in an experimental situation? So I told you isogenic animals have a large variability in, in their age, but you can change genes. Now all the animals have a different gene, they have a different mutation, and it extends their lifespan. So they, their average lifespan grows, 
but they still have 30% around that new lifespan. So experiments like that are, are interesting. In worms and mice and flies, sir, you can uh, find, you can make mutations that extend or shrink the average lifespan. And, and work, and that started, let's say, in the 70s, and work, a lot of work, you can imagine, about those, what these genes are. Let's welcome you back with your nice big sound, baby. <sighs> the more the better. And they are, a lot of the genes uh, cluster in, 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 in a pathway that controls uh, the organism's growth. It's called the IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor pathway, and mTOR, and it controls, apparently what it does is, the animals grow more slowly, and they enter a state where like, they're expecting stresses, and their repair is better. So there's a way inside a given species to tune the balance between growing and repairing, and also between reproduction and repairing. So that has something to do with lifespan. And talk a little bit more about that. And so it's extendable. It's also extendable by environment. So there's a famous uh, calorie restriction. How many of you have heard of calorie restriction? About 10%, so 20%. So with different uh, organisms, if you, if you basically starve them, you give them much less food, but they're still alive, uh, their lifespan, lifespan extends. You can ask by how much. So I think in, in silicon, the maximum you can extend experimentally is something like from two weeks to three times that. And in mice, which live two and a half years, you can't go to three times that. You can go to, I think the maximum I've seen is mice that live four years at average lifespan, experimentally, instead of two and a half. So it could be that the larger the lifespan, the less you can manipulate. We don't know for human beings. Oh, I should say that uh, this IGF-1 mutation appears in human beings. Actually, it's a growth hormone receptor mutation. You get what's called Laurent dwarfism, which is it's a growth pathway. And they do indeed have long lifespan and resist cancer and diabetes. And stuff like that. So there's also in humans, there's evidence. And that's why people try to take now, some people try to take drugs that affect this pathway, like metformin, hoping that it will increase their longevity. Yeah. Always have to think about trade-offs, because hey, not clear. Yeah. Huh? OK, I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> the secret of life. <laughs> ah, the level of interest in the class. <laughs> it's electric. <laughs> this, this field attracts. Uh, it, it's one problem is the height kind of in the field of aging because uh, um, we're not going to talk about, I think the dream of having a perturbation that makes you live much longer is, uh, is a dream. And also if that it really exists, it'll take us decades to find out. But the, the possibility of slowing down age-related diseases in one fell swoop, finding the cause of it, is not, it's not a dream. That's, I think, a real reality to it. Going to materialize in the next decades. So extended the health span. Um, okay, uh, so we talked about calorie restriction on the IGF-1. A low temperature makes organisms grow slower and live longer. See elegance? Flies. Uh, messing up with repair pathways, I'll tell you more about that, like messing up with DNA repair and autophagy makes you live shorter. So there's disease in human beings called progeria, which means you age quickly. Some in, the, in a bad progeria, very rare, thankfully, let's say one of those congenital mutations that you really unlucky, you get it in your egg and all your cells in your body as a defect in DNA repair. And children age so quickly that they die in teenage years of age-related diseases. So like really like mm -hmm. accelerated mm -hmm. aging. Mm -hmm. What are age-related diseases? So, um, what is age? Um, what is an objective age? Not counting. So, first of all, they die around 14, 15, yeah, no, and they die of causes like heart failure, cancer, <coughs> diabetes. Um, they have osteoarthritis. They have um, all these, uh, and all these age-related diseases. We're going to talk about them in the next, like, in a coming lecture about age, how the clock of aging-related diseases. Um, 
there it looks like the same thing, the same survival curve, but shrunk by a huge factor. You don't have like anything that's I mean, some people have everything, some don't. You don't have something like to measure most people Ages, right? Ah, so your question, can we measure a person's biological age? That's what you're asking? As opposed to chronological age? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, try, I'll talk about that too. Uh, the, the answer is right now, it's n not really. But what you can do is look at a person's function, a physiological function. Okay, so if we talk about physiological function, it's maybe I should have said physiological and cognitive function declines with with what? Oh yeah, age. It's supposed to be laugh at that. This is a joke. Really? <laughs> So here is a, another set of nice plots, age tau. So generally speaking, uh, if you measure performance like kidney function. So kidney function you can measure by, let's say, blood urea, nitrogen. So nitro uh, urea isn't supposed to be in the blood. Kidney is supposed to excrete it. And blood urea, nitrogen starts rising, or even at age 30, starts rising, 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 rising. And opening up. So the difference between people opens up with age also. It's important to know. So if you're a lot of 30-year-olds have similar health, but by the time they're 80, you can have one that's running a marathon and another one that can't walk, right? One in the grave. So things open up. So um, kidney functions, liver functions, uh, how mem oh yeah, memory, right? So, so they decline, decline. Usually something like this. I mean, the functions because the, the, the blood tests rise, the functions decline like this. And why? Because a lot of organs have spare capacity. That's another interesting thing. Spare capacity. You can remove 90% of the kidney, pancreas, two thirds of the liver, and the person's. You know, you can do a kidney. You can donate your kidney. And fine. So. Organs have square capacity. You die when you go down to 10%. Also, when we talk about autoimmune disease, you can kill 90% of the beta cells, but then you get to the symptoms. So, organisms have spare capacity in their organs. You can live with 10% of your kidney, but you can't really live if, if it's a stressful situation. You can live, but not. The, the spare capacity is there for a reason. To, uh, when you, it's like an engineer designing a bridge. You know that we have certain amount of trucks going on, you design for three times more weight. Right? So it's like tolerance for injuries, diseases, and stuff like that. So, so, uh, so that's how functions go down. And cognitive functions also. Most cognitive functions go down, like uh, it's the speed, math ability. Yeah? Some don't go down so much, like verbal <coughs> ability. Some go up, like uh, crystallized intelligence, like how you like uh, knowledge about the world and things like this. So, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert exactly how you measure, but you can find these curves if you want. So that's um, that's something different between the age 10 to 20 and age 70 to 80. There's something different about you, and we want to understand what is it that accumulates in the body that's different. What is it that's different? What's the fu fundamental source, or if there is one? <coughs> And where was I? Okay, so uh, so yeah, so um, yeah, so so these decline. So in progeria, this disease of early aging, you can measure also these these declines. So you ask about uh, a way to measure a person's uh, biological age, right? So yeah. You describe these graphs, the kidney versus survival, as very different graphs, but but. And from, from the plot, it doesn't look so different, but I imagine that actually many people who die have a normal functioning kidney. That's right. So this is one person, this is another person, this is another person. So there's a large variation in kidney function. 
And, uh, and, it's, it, and it's, this is a different y-axis. This is survival probability to survive to 20. And this is some measurement of the kidney function, some physiological measurement you can do. Right. So uh, some, some tests you can do. So it's not the same. But it's true that some fraction of people, not so few, die from kidney failure. That's one of the major causes of death. It could be heart, heart failure that makes the kidney work less of the well. And you have more urea in your blood and screws up all your organs. So how people die is also fascinating. We'll maybe also discuss that. Um, if you can take it. I don't know if you guys can take it. Can you take it? <laughs> I can't take it. Yeah. So uh, we said the death has some stochastic element to it. Yeah. Does aging have a stochastic element? Like, will, will twins age the same, ah. but die a different time? Yeah, so uh, identical twins raised in the same environment. So just like in mice, they also have the 30%. That's, that's, that's a problem. That's what we find from isogenic animals. But will they age the same, like the kidney? Ah, their kidney functions. There will be more, this more heritable. Okay. The different functions are more heritable, uh, especially if you have a problem. If you have a problem, and like if you have, so if these twins inherited a gene that, so in order to get cancer, you need a few mut mutations. They usually happen, you're not born with them. They happen in unlucky cell. But if you're born with one of them, it's, you get cancer much earlier because you just need, instead of three, you just need two. So if you're born with one, all your cells have them. So that means that's, mutations make you prone to cancer. So if the twins have that, they're really more prone to cancer. And uh, so and that's part of the genetic heritability of, there is some genetic heritability of that, like in humans, maybe 20%, 15%. Is there the same distance from cancer, but one of them might get it and the other one might, might not? Right, yeah, that's also true. That's yeah, you might get it at different ages. And so here we're, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and if I plot here, you know what? Before we go on, I, I, I give you a lot of information. I want to help you process it. Please, I want you now to find someone you don't know, you haven't talked to yet, maybe behind you, or not talked to so, so much in this course, and listen to what question they have, or tell, ask them a question or a comment about what we discussed so far. I just want to give some space for processing and get, get you a chance to get answer each other. So please, let's do that for a couple of minutes. Someone new. Could be someone sitting on the side, for example. Yeah, say hi. Tell me if you're a Yeah. 
why I'm old and yeah. angry and it's supposed to be a thing. Okay, so I mean, Misha is asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I take. Uh, since me and, this is Gidi, my brother. We, uh, I'm 19 years older than Gidi, right? Sorry. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, what's, what's my. So Misha is saying, we learned that cells turn over in the body, right? So the cells are the same age. So what's the difference? And that leads me exactly to the same point. Where in the body does it accumulate the difference? Right, that's what we want to ask. Maybe mutations. Mutations. Yeah, I agree. I think mutations are a good candidate. For, because what we want is something that stays in the body. Mutations in some cells that stay in the body. With us, not cells like the skin cells that uh, are made and in 30 days they're removed. So if they have a mutation, who cares? So what stays in the body? Now, now we're getting molecular on you, right? So uh, this is a good place to uh, acknowledge that everything we did so far is basically not molecular, it's population. So 1825, you could do it by counting deaths, uh, counting how many worms die, how many flies die. So this is what's called demographics of aging, population statistics of aging, and there are these laws. And now we want to see, can we explain those laws by something molecular biology? So where are the cells? Who are these cells? What? And that's what we want to try to do. And I would just want to say that so right now in, in biology, there is a gap between research in molecular biology, where you find a lot of theories of aging and mechanisms in it, and the, the Gompert's law and stuff like that. It's like two different disciplines working in parallel. And uh, we want to bridge the gap in this lecture, next lecture, and, le and next lecture. That's the goal. So that's so important. I'm going to write it down here. Try to bridge or link, bridge between the uh, population laws and molecular level. Two levels of description. Did I explain myself? So, uh, um, so there was one more fun thing I wanted to do on the population level. I'm not going to I'm, not, I'm going to answer a question, but there's another fun thing I wanted to do with you at the molecular level. It's not really, a, I mean, on the population. I want to erase this thing. Oh, here it is. Okay. I'm going to erase this. And just to say that uh, longevity is experimentally perturbable, but it also changes a lot with evolution. So evolution can also change longevity. And I want to ask, just to mention a little bit of thinking about that. Why is it that mice live two and a half years and whales, bowhead whales, live 200 years? Both mammals. So I'm going to plot here mass, and here this is longevity. Longevity, this, there's mean lifespan. Longevity, usually uh, maximum lifespan ever measured. Something like that. And there's a, uh, so here we have a one gram. 10 gram. This is the world of the mouse. I live, a, as I said, a two and a half years. And I'm going to put some log scale here. <coughs> 10 year, 30 year. So the mouse lives here. And the whale, how much does the whale weigh? Let's say 100 tons. 100 tons is 100 times a thousand. No? 100 tons. Yeah. Huh? One ton of whale? No. 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 The big whale. I think yeah, elephant is like 10 tons. No. Let's say 20 tons. Let's say 20 tons. Let's say 10 tons. 10 tons is 10 times 1,000 times 1,000 grams per kilo. So it's 10 to the 7. Let's write 10 to the 8. Okay, it's a fat whale. So it lived 200. And for a long time, uh, there, you can find in the books a kind of a law. So you put here different animals. Camels, cows, elephants. Turtles? So, not talking about turtles, because they're <laughs> not mammals, but they also, there's a big turtle that lives more than 200 years. I saw him in, when I was diving in Hawaii, and he came to visit me. It was like being in the presence of an ancient being. <laughs> it's very amazing. That's time for another lecture. And it was uh, believed that longevity goes like mass to the power of one-fourth. So here we have 
10 to the 8 to the power 1 fourth is 100, so from 2 years to 200 years. Uh, but there were some outliers that people threw under the carpet, but when you actually plot the whole data, let's say you take a database of all 2,000 mammals, it's not a line, it's because what are the outliers? There's a, there's a bat. So here I put the mouse, and here I put the whale, and here I put the bat. The bat weighs like a mouse, it lives not 30 years. And also the naked mole rat, where it look, where, uh, weighs like a rat, and also lives 30 years. Naked mole rat. And then here are all the bat species. And here are the squirrels. And here are the primates. And here are the birds. They're not mammals, but they're also only with And it turns out you get a triangle. So this is okay. Let's, let's think about that for a second. This is not okay. It, it is okay. It's just not good for lifespan. And diabetes, cancer, osteoarthritis. It's it. Plants live so much longer. Plants live longer, yeah. Maybe they know, I don't, but it could, it's interesting. But just I want to just comment on this. This is called the Mass Longevity Triangle. And it's covered by Pablo Sekeli when he was a PhD student with me, 2015. And the reason is as follows. This is an evolutionary reason. And the evolutionary thinking about aging since the 50s, more or less, uh, converged on the following theory for aging. The theory is this. Um, natural selection works on young reproductive organisms. Now, if you have extrinsic mortality that says, like a mouse, you'll be eaten in a year, the strategy is to make a lot of babies fast. Rather than repair your DNA, repair your uh, process. So it's putting resource into growing fast, reproducing, and not maintenance. It's called the disposable soma theory. Soma means body. And you care about the germline, basically moving to the next generation. So this is live, live fast, die young, leave a good looking corpse. But when your mass is long, you have low extrinsic mortality. So this is high extrinsic mortality. And the whales have very low extrinsic mortality. H0, remember, is extrinsic mortality. Because they're so big, nobody eats them. Also elephants, etc. And they have a different strategy. They grow slowly. They make a baby once in a while. They take care of the baby. They teach the baby. They give the baby. People are a little bit like that. And then, what about this? That's an interesting strategy. This, are, this is called protective niche. So extrinsic mortality is also low because the bats fly or live in the cave, they heart, or squirrels live up in the tree. Naked mole rat lives underground. And basically it's like an ants. There's the mother, queen, the lady that makes uh, babies. The workers are basically infertile and they have a so social, so, and it's hard to eat them. So they have low extrinsic mortality. So their life strategy is different. You, you, they make, they make babies very, very rarely per unit lifespan, more than whales, I think. And they take care of their babies a lot. They teach them. The bats carry the baby on their back. They teach them where the tree is, if you know, Wodanowski's research. They spend a lot of time how to live in this protected niche. That's how they make their living, but they're small. So that's, now you can ask, why a triangle? Why are there missing animals here? So uh, one reason, of course, is to be a whale, you can't live two years because you have to make your, whatever, 10 tons, one ton, you have to grow. But there, you, can, you can grow fat, you can grow fat. So th the reason is, and this we'll get to later, is because of basically um, optimal trade-off. So if you have three archetypal strategies, No matter what niche you live, a point inside the triangle is closer to these three points than a point outside the triangle. So if you have an animal here, there's an animal here, 
It's closer to the three best strategies. And therefore, this animal will outcompete this animal. You mentioned there's two uh, strategies. Yeah, so this is a fast life strategy. This is a slow life strategy. And this is also a slow life strategy. But the reason is here, you're, there's low predation because you're big. Here's a low predation because you have a protected niche. So that's it. Protected niche, biggest, and you live fast. Did I explain myself here? Okay, so now about being obese. I'm going to say something I hope I'm going to be clear. The bigger you are, the longer you live, basically, right? But if you take a single species, let's say a dog, and you look inside the dog, people have selected dogs to, live, to be bigger or smaller. So you have Great Dane and Chihuahua. It's the opposite rule inside the species. The bigger you are, Danes live six years, and Chihuahuas live 20 years. So inside the species, the bigger you are, the faster you fall. But across species, the bigger you are, the longer you live. So there's diff something different about tuning inside the species with the genes available and evolutionary selection that works over 10 million years, <coughs> changing everything about the organism. And that's that's interesting to think about. It's again one of those open qu questions in general. Why a lot of times rules between species and rules within a species are different or the same. Or, yeah. Is this true for every kind of species? What is true? Right. So you say that for different species, if you're bigger, you're longer. Generally, right? You, you, think you, can, you have this direction too. So yeah. Bad, yeah. So general. General. And for a specific species, so if you're bigger, you're less. Yeah. That's true for dogs, but can you Yeah, also I, I told you the example of the, also in humans, by the way. Uh, longevity corresponds negatively with height. And uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Ah. So, again, it's weak. But, and also these Laurent dwarfs, I told you about. Uh, the dogs, what mutations are there in dogs? What, how do you go from Great Dane to Chihuahua? A lot of those mutations are the same IGF1 pathway that we talked about in the mice. So they grow less and live longer. So. It could be the way that you do it. You do it in certain mutations when you select and in the lab and different mutations. I don't know how to answer, but that's just one of you guys to know. It's a very interesting question. Changes can be one person like dogs. They all care about passing the germline. Yeah, so how, how could this be in a group like dogs if they all care about passing the germline? So in dogs, it's a human being who selected them. So, but uh, in other uh, uh, cases, you can have animals, like say a certain animal, like a camel, but some of them maybe live in a, in a situation with less and more extrinsic mortality, or less and more, depending on, or I know camel is also domesticated. So, okay. yeah. Or do you do salamander to this? Because it regenerates, so. Yeah, salamander. So, it's salamander again is not a mammal or homeotherm, but um, the, there's, I think there's something similar for um, non homeotherms too, but I, I don't know too much about it. And also insects. So by the way, uh, you can extrapolate down to E. coli, <coughs> the way it's a picogram, and you get a uh, one hour. So you take the. So it might also. Be. And, and the trade off is that the smaller you are, the, hi the higher your metabolic rate per unit biomass. It goes like mass to the minus one quarter. So there's these called allometric relationships. All right, so now we want to address Misha's question about the molecular. We want to go molecular on aging. We want to go molecular. So let's erase some of these. Um, yeah. Um, so some species uh, do not reproduce, I mean, lose security at the same time. And then that explanation should be um, the way that being big should be not as advantageous. You're, you're saying that uh, there's a difference between species and the age of reproduction? No. I mean, so, some, like, they will lose, like, historically, past population will be at a certain point. So, this whole thing should change, I presume. I mean, because the only, only advantage you get if you're well and you live for a long time, that yeah, why don't you reproduce more? Why don't you reproduce uh, m more often as a way? I, didn't, I don't understand your question. Maybe after the class, I think so. Um, 
I wrote a little song about aging. Forever! <laughs> That's it. All right, let's continue. So, molecular. So, when you look at the molecular world, so I said there's a missing link. So, when you look at the molecular world, you can look up on Wikipedia molecular theories of aging, and you find several theories of aging. And the, the reason for these theories of aging is if you screw up, a certain repair mechanism, like DNA repair, you indeed get premature aging. So there's many ways to get premature aging. You can screw up DNA repair. You can screw up um, taking, removing damaged proteins, proteostasis, autophagy, where the cell eats up its own damaged proteins. If you screw that up, you get premature aging. You can screw up mitochondria repair. You can screw up reactive oxygen species detoxification, so all these you know, nasty chemicals, byproduct of metabolism, that damage the DNA or damage the protein. So the, each one of these is a molecular theory of aging. Say, DNA, the mutations are more important. No. Autophagy is more important. No. Protostasis is more important. No. Mitochondria are the, the thing, the fountain of youth. Right? So that causes um, a lot of information. It's, that's the way I look at it. Uh, if you ask people from the autophagy field, they'll say, of course, autophagy is a major cause of aging, because if I screw up autophagy, I get a um, reduction in lifespan. Do you agree? Is that an accurate try? No. So, so uh, we have your expert on proteostasis, multi Shabbat. And when I look at it, I, I kind of favor, in a certain way, DNA damage because of the thing you asked. So it, we, I want to explain why, what, what, what's, what's different about age tw 10 to 20 and different from, eight, from 70 to 80. So if I have a cell that has a damaged protein, that cell is going to basically go away, like a skin cell drop off. I need something permanent, something permanent. That, and of course, I want all of these facts, all these uh, molecular theories to, to be important. But I want to look at the fundamental cause. And w the only thing I can think of, but maybe that's because of my limitations, is that you need a kind of cell that stays with you. And what is a cell that stays with you? Um, there, there are a few kinds, but a, a generic kind that's present in the body in different places is called stem cells. So what I'm going to tell you is I think it's mutations in stem cells. And so what is stem cells? So if we I take the skin as an example. Okay. So the skin, it works like this. The skin is made of the top cell layer is dead cells, and which are become, and they get sloughed off, let's say, every, every month or something. And how do, you, how do you repair it? How do you still have skin? It's because deep layer, the epidermis, are these cells called stem cells that know to do two things. One is they know how to renew themselves. And the other thing they know how to differentiate, that's to change, differentiate into skin cells, keratinocytes. And these are alive. And they also multiply a few times, not too much. And then they die and become the top layer, and then they're soft up. So then we have a column, a process like that. It keeps going. And these stem cells stay with us. Another area situation, very important, is, in, uh, is blood. blood. So we have our red blood cells. They live 100 days. Okay. But how are they made? Inside our bones, yeah, we have the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is full of these stem cells that can do two things. They can renew, or they can differentiate into red blood cells, white blood cells. And we, and, and we live with those stem cells. The stem cells, they divide, but they stay, they stay with us. Why are they in the bone it's a, or deep under the skin? Stem cells are a lot of times found in a protected niche, you could say. Because you want to keep them away from mutations and damage as much as you can. But you still, they need to be accessible to. Also in the lung, the epithelium, which gets sloughed off. In the intestine, uh, those intestinal cells, it's just every week they're replaced. 
So the crypts, intestinal crypts have stem cells and make the, the cells, they go up these villi and then they get sloughed up at the top of these villi. So these stem cells are all over the body. And they stay with us. As opposed to the differentiated cells that have a finite life, lifespan. So what if one way to think about what can carry with us is that, remember, one of the fundamental things about dividing cells is that once in a while, they'll get a mutation. In fact, each division, each base pair, 10 to the minus 9, there's about 10 to the 9 base pairs. So each division, you have a mutation somewhere. Isn't that crazy? So, so stem cells accumulate mutations. So if the mutation is very bad, stem cell is going to kill itself. But if the mutation is a mutation that doesn't come into play in the stem cell, it comes into play in the differentiated cell, because the differentiated cell st starts expressing proteins that are for skin cells, not for stem cells. Then that cell, so what the idea is that here you have your stem cells, stem cell, stem cell, <laughs> stem cell, making differentiated cell, differentiated cell, dying. Then once in a while, a stem cell is going to be mutated in a way that makes these guys defective. And then this stem cell is, doesn't know that it's mutant. But at, on top of it, you get a column of defective cells. And that happens here, 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 here. And with age, the number of mutant stem cells should grow with age. So the number of mutant stem cells should grow something like eta tau. So it's the number grows with age. Why linearly? That's the way mutations happen. We, re, we exchange 70 grams of mass every day. So there's this, that much divisions every day and that much mutations every day. And every day, a new batch of stem cells get mutated. And so it, it's very bad if those mutants have a growth advantage. If those mutant stem cells start expanding, then you get a lot more. And that's a kind of cancers like leukemia. And stuff. That can, that's bad. A lot of cancers could be... Um, associated with that process. But so that's one hypothesis about what is it that's different between Gidi and me. Okay, so I'm 50 now. I won't say how old Gidi is. He's 19 years young. <laughs> He's finished his PhD in physics. <laughs> so nice that you're here in this class. Very amazing. It's <laughs> <laughs> I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do ya? It goes like this the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall the major lift nice high family moment. So, um, so it could be now that these damaged cells here, they have a protein, one of, so mutation means piece of your DNA is different, so there's a letter different. The protein made is different, it has a bad shape. And now this protein is making reactive oxygen species. This protein is making bad mitochondria, which are like the energy plant of the cell. This protein is making Act, all these molecular theories of aging. So if I, if I screw up those uh, repair mechanisms, of course I have more bad effects from those mutant cells and more damage. That's easy to understand. So all these theories of aging are important. But maybe the fundamental thing is something that it has to be something that stays with you. Anyway. Did I explain myself? I think that makes sense. I don't know. So we're now getting kind of into the unknown. Uh, the idea that of stem cells, ROS, autophagy. Autophagy is a, pro is a process where the cell eats up its damaged proteins. And <laughs> this is really amazing. Okay, so you take a mouse like this. And you make it so that it doesn't have 
autophagy so well, so it does have this repair. And the mouse very quickly, it dies after nine months, not two and a half years, and it looks like a hunchback mouse. Its ears are like this. Cataract. Bad fur. And if you engineer a mouse where you turn off autophagy, but then you turn it on, back on, in the last moment before it's dead, this mouse lives now like a normal mouse, more or less. And the hunchback goes away. Can you imagine that? So that? When I saw that a year ago, I said, wow, it's so plastic some of these. Not all the aging phenotypes go away. And like some, something in the muscle fiber still doesn't repair. But a lot of them do. A lot of them do. So some plasticity. Kind of. So that's how, wow, that's, that's pretty neat. And so those repair processes are very important. OK. And yeah, of course, they die. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, they don't die. They now live for two years. Or so. yeah, because they have normal autophagy. Okay, so, and I also want to talk about programming. Some people think that uh, aging is programmed. That's to say, it's not damaged, but there's something uh, like a clock that's programmed. And uh, there's evidence in C. elegans where once they make the eggs and they can reproduce and the eggs are functioning, they stop making repair proteins. So that's also interesting. That has to do also with disposable soma theories. And uh, as we go to the next lecture, I want to um, explore mathematically how we can get from these ideas, start to get from these ideas, to the Gompert's law. How we can connect. What is, what is this stochastic thing? What's going on? What's the randomness? and a lot of the other uh, phenotypes about aging. And it'll help me for you to know that um, another thing about this plasticity of aging, this is age tau, and this is hazard. But now I'm going to talk about fruit flies. What I want to make the point is that um, just like with this hunchback mouse, you can reverse things very quickly in certain situations. So here is the hazard of fruit flies. Okay, so it's a log, right? So this is the Gompert's law, e to the alpha t. Everything's fine. They die, time scale like, you know, 30 days or something like that. These are fruit flies. Now, if you grow them on calorie restriction diet, that's to say, lifespan extending diet, their hazard looks like this. So this is lifespan extending diet. Super. Now what happens if you grow them for a while on normal diet and then switch to lifespan exp extending diet? So you can ask yourself, what do you think will happen in this situation? And so it's very important to do an experiment. So you grow them on normal diet and then this will, this will happen. So this is switch <coughs> to lifespan extending diet. And vice versa, if I, uh, if they go from, if they're here, and you switch to normal diet, you go like this. And time scale, two days. No memory. So there's some fast time scale. Yeah, right. So in this case, it's a fast time scale. Too. So that's something also we need to explain. There is a memory of age. There is a memory of age, yeah. but, there, but there is no memory of what you ate. Exactly. There is a memory of age because you go back to the, to the line with the that? age. Huh? What are those? Flies. So these are fruit flies. They look like this. <laughs> and that's not clear as far as I know. Yeah. So you can do a lot of things to flies <laughs> that you can't do to. Yeah. But in smoking, for example, we know that if someone stops smoking, if he doesn't go back to the face time. Yeah, so smoking and makes you die faster. Yeah. And there, it's mixed there, it's different. If you stop smoking before a certain age, like 40 or something like that, a lot of the effects are reversible. But if you stop smoking later, they're less. So that's also interesting to understand. 
And uh, smoking is very linear. It's linear what's called pack years. The number of packs you smoke times the number of years you smoke. The damage, kind of, or the effect on longevity. That's, that's more complicated. Um, and yeah, and then there's this, uh, we're coming to a close very soon. Okay, so it's a nice deep sigh of relief. And there's a, a very n a new theory of aging that we're going to use. It's, it's new, it's in the last decade especially, became very, um, very hot, very hot because uh, of some new experiments. And um, yeah, so uh, I mean, we're getting clues, right? There's there's a rapid time scale, but there's memory. What is, there's a stochastic process. We want we're getting clues for how how to approach this problem. And so senescent cells. are cells that are damaged. And again, it could be any kind of, any one of those damage, the DNA damage, reactive oxygen, cancer, genes, etc. And they become big cells. They're very active, but they stop dividing. And these cells are very important in young organisms because if you get injured, so suppose you have your, your piece of skin and you get a lot of uh, sunburn or something like that. And those cells have mutations and they're likely to become cancer cells. Or something. So one option is the cells to kill themselves. That's called apoptosis. But if all the cells did that, you'd have a hole. So or you have an injury in your heart. The cells, if you those cells kill themselves, you have a hole. So it's not, not so good. So instead of what the cells do, they stop dividing, so they don't become cancer cells. And they say, okay, stop. Everybody stop. We've got to repair. So, and they secrete very actively some molecules. Secreted, Cessness and Sosocio did secrete profile molecules. That, first of all, they te tell the local stem cells to stop dividing or slow dividing. So they stop the local cells, the cells everywhere around them from dividing. They stop. Then they say, they call the immune system macrophages and NK cells, special cells of the immune system, to come and kill them. So they actually call the immune system, they make an inflammation, and say, come remove me. These are like garbage trucks. They come in, they say, oh, this is a senescent cell. Okay. Once they're removed, the stem cells around them no longer inhibited and divide, and you basically have a slow, orderly process of repair. For injury repair, you have to have a little bit of inflammation, senescence, senescence cells removed, healing. So they're really important in young organisms. Really important. The problem is, you're not designed to be old. When you're old, you have a lot of these stem cell making damaged cells. And these cells are damaged and they become senescent. Let's uh, call, call these cells blue. You see how a lot of senescent, these cells become senescent. So you have senescent cell here, senescent cell here. Above this damaged stem cell, you have a column of senescent cells. By the way, a nice place you can see this in the skin. These uh, moles that you have in the skin are columns of senescent cells above a damaged um, stem cell, without a uh, melanocyte stem cell. And what this means is that the number of senescent cells in your body rises almost exponentially with age. Why? Because there's more and more cells that make them. And we need to understand why it's exponentially not linear. As we'll show you next time, it's because they saturate the garbage trucks. There's, you're born with that much garbage trucks when you're young and when you're old. There's not enough garbage trucks to get rid of them. Garbage piles up in the street. 
And what happens then? The senescent cells make your whole body full of inflammation. And that's called inflammaging. So one thing about old being old is chronic low grade inflammation everywhere, which is really bad for because inflammation causes a lot of damage around it, increases the risk of cancer, it gives you insulin resistance, as I told you, so more diabetes, etc. And it slows down all the stem cell divisions. So indeed your cells are actually older because the stem cells are dividing uh, less often. So each, each blood cell is older, on average. on average. So your cells are older also. And therefore, they are thought to be a, a, a major cause of aging. And just like the other theories, you can ask what happens when you remove them. So I want to show you, Evan, maybe you can help me. So this is a um, Van Dorsen um, lab in the Mayo Clinic. 2011, he did it on progeria mice. In 2016, he did it on different kind of wild type mice. Well, sure, I'll show you a picture. He made mice that genetically have a, a killer gene on ins that only works in senescent cells. He wants to kill senescent cells, because he removes senescent cells from the body with a genetic trick where you engineer the mouse so that if you give it a, a, some chemical, it kills all the senescent cells in the body. Did I explain myself? And they took genetically identical mice, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, some of these genetically identical mice from year one, okay, they're now middle aged, got injections every week or several weeks of this uh, chemical, so they removed their senescent cells from middle age. And the other mice got also injections just with the liquid, without the drug, right? It's called control, sham, mock, placebo. And because the injections themselves are kind of a little bit stressful for mice. It's a, and then I want to show you a picture of the mice. Let me turn off the lights. A lot of drama. Yeah, it's a question. You said that the problem was that there's not enough. Uh, Love to go around. <laughs> yeah, go on. Answer. Not enough uh, gallon structure. Yeah. So why is it good that you should be selling a So the, the idea here is to get rid of senescent cells. The senescent cells are like the zombie cells, right? They stop dividing and they make inflammation and they make slow down. So the theory was, what happens if you remove them? You'll get... Yeah. The problem was not that the body doesn't uh, clean them, it's that they don't clean they don't <coughs> faster. Yeah. So if they're dead, they're faster. Oh, I see. Yeah, exactly. The idea, this, what this drug does is basically kill them and then, yeah, it could be take a little bit time to clear them, but at least they don't secrete those factors that cause inflammation and... Ah, yeah. Inflammation. yeah, it's inflammation, it's the SAS that's, that's the problem. It's a good point, it's, they kill them, they actually commit programmed cell death, which means they can kill themselves, wrap themselves up, and then macrophages come and <coughs> take them. That process apparently is still fine. Okay, so... Anyway, what happened is that the... Uh, turn, turn it on. Ah. I was hoping for a big effect to wrap up. The <laughs> just press on it, it should be on. Oh, yeah, I think Abby managed to do it, no? Yeah. Anyway, what happened was that the, the mice where you cleared senescent cells, this is what ignited the field. They lived 25% uh, longer on average. They still died. They lived 25% longer on average. And they had uh, slower onset of cancer, cataract, diabetes, osteoarthritis. And they just looked better. I don't know. So the... Um, so uh, what did they die from? Huh? What did they die from? They eventually died. Most, uh, most mice died from cancer. So if you keep mice in the lab, most of them die from lymphomas and stuff like that. Um, because um, 
It's as if they don't invest in anti-cancer mechanisms, as like we do, because you know they're going to be killed in a year, out in the wild. And whereas elephants, naked mole arts, almost never get cancer. And also people, we get much less cancer than, than we should, because it's always a very old age. So anyway, so these are genetically identical mice, and one of them, one of them got the treatment. Can you guess which one? <laughs> and uh, he was running on the wheel several hours a day, and the two, this mouse is just like a regular two-year-old mouse. It doesn't run on the wheel, and has a hunchback, fur uh, problems, cataract, and uh, then other labs used um, not this genetic trick, but real drugs that were developed for human beings for anti-cancer drugs, uh, it discovered the same drugs can also specifically kill senescent cells, but those drugs were not approved for humans because they cause thrombopenia and things like they mess up. They're not approved, but you can use them on mice to kill senescent cells. And you get the same thing, and that, that, that way it's been done, I don't know, maybe many labs have reproduced this, and disease by disease, if you have a knee injury, like a knee osteoarthritis, what's called, you inject uh, these drugs and there's healing uh, of the osteoarthritis. Or diabetes, Alzheimer's, um, are all kind of improved by removing senescent cells. So as you can imagine, there's a big uh, excitement. It's, it's one theory of aging, there's other theories of aging. And they still die, it's not the only causal factor. But the interesting thing about it is that it's so, um, it's so universal for age-related diseases and also has a kind of clear, nice link because these senescent cells, they stand at an interesting level. There's all the molecular theories of aging, DNA damage, mitochondrial damage, telomere shortening. You know, they all cause senescence, and senescence causes things you can understand on the tissue level, inflammation, slow down stem cell repair. So, so they're an interesting link between the molecular level and the tissue or organism level. And we're going to run with them next lecture and uh, also try to, yeah. Uh, so the difference between these mice is also how they live and also the treatment of the drug? Yes, and the difference is how they lived. I mean, you said that uh, the mouse looks better, like did some exercise, but it also got the drug and this one didn't. Oh, I got it, yeah. So the question is, is there a difference in how they live? So they yeah. grow in the same cages, they have the same access to the wheel. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and at one year of age, they're both running on the wheel. And this one just keeps running on the wheel longer. So maybe it's living longer also because it's getting more exercise. Yeah. So that's part of the thing. That's, I think, a great thing to remember about aging, especially for human beings, is if you have a little decline in your knee, maybe it makes you exercise less, move less, and then maybe that hurts your cardiovascular, your heart, and maybe that affects your kidney system. So it's all interconnected, and, and definitely also with mice. So thanks for the question. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. But they get the same access to the wheel, right? The same food. And, and we'll try to basically build on what we did today, which is basic concepts in aging, to explain, to try to bridge the link, the gap between molecular explanations and population level phenotype or behavior, uh, facts of life, facts of aging. It's what we'll do in the next lecture. So let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being so attentive. And I wish you a nice, healthy life. <laughs>